Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Comic Source Comic Boom DC Spotlight. This is for all the comics being released on April 7th, 2021. We hope you all had a very safe and happy Easter. And we're going to talk about uh, a few of the books where we've moved along. You know, this is we're starting to get into the second month of DC's Infinite Frontier era. And, you know, we're starting to see things shake out. We're starting to get a feel for uh, how things are going to go. We do know that DC does still have some titles coming in Infinite Frontier that, that haven't debuted yet. They didn't debut in that first month of, of this era in March. So, for example, today we're going to talk about Green Lantern, number one. And there are some other books and miniseries and whatnot that still need to debut as well. Uh, but I think I certainly felt, I don't want to speak for Rocky, but it, it seems like he felt similarly that the first couple of weeks of Infinite Frontier kind of surprised us in, in the quality, you know, after we had seen Future State be not so great, to be honest. Um, and then the quality seemed to, to fall off. And now we've sort of wrapped around to where, get, where we're getting the second issues of, of this era for some books. And I got to say, for me, this week was a, a, a step back from uh, the first week of, of Infinite Frontier. So I don't know, Rocky, how did you feel? Did these books overall do it for you? Or did you feel like it was a step back? Where, uh, where did you land? Uh, overall, I think it's maintaining the. Uh, I I was entertained. I was entertained. I, yeah. I I thought if I'm if I one observation I'll make is that there DC seems to be definitely moving towards some of the storylines started in Future State, which is I'm not too sure if I if I like that, but I you know I I enjoyed Tinian's Batman with the Ghost Maker Crime Syndicate and Suicide Squad. I thought it was an entertaining Swamp Thing. Uh, I thought Swamp Thing ended a two-issue story arc that I thought was excellent. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I still have a smile on my face. Uh, maybe not. Maybe some of the glow's gone, but I'm still, I'm still positive this week. I'm still positive. I'm, I'm sorry to hear All that right. you're not. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna make for an, an interesting uh, episode. Am I? Will I come around to your way of thinking? Will you come around to mine? Will we still end up on the same side? I just, yeah, I didn't feel that level of surprise that I felt the first week of March when these came out. And I thought, Oh, this is pretty, even, even crime syndicate, which I, I, it wasn't my crime syndicate, but uh, you know, we, we actually talked a little bit to, to Andy Schmidt and he, you know, he was mentioning some, some things about a new version and seeing their, their origin and how they've come together. You had mentioned that in our, our last review where, you know, we hadn't ever really seen that. So I was willing to, to give it a chance, but uh, we still haven't got, Alexander Luther, I will say that. And I have a feeling that maybe it might improve for me. So I'm going to give it another, uh, at least one more. I'm going to go to the third issue. But the second issue still, I don't know, it's just not not clicking for me. It's not terrible, um, but it's just not clicking. So uh, why don't we start off with that? Why don't we start off with uh, with Crime Syndicate? With Crime Syndicate, all right. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, and as I'm, uh, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was just going to read off the, the creative, the creative teams. Yeah, I mentioned ahead, written by Andy Schmidt. We have art by um, Dexter Soy, and or is it? Is it? No, it's. Uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, Kieran McCown uh, with with Dexter Vines on inks and Steve Olaf on colors. So, uh, yeah, you go first. Give us your thoughts. Well, I had. Uh, uh, <clears throat> well, this issue. One of the great things about the first issue of Crime Syndicate is, is that I thought it had a lot of ni nice Easter eggs. We know that Earth three is the opposite. It's the reverse, essentially, of 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 essentially Earth designate zero, and we know that good is bad and bad is good. and And I like the this issue picks up right off from last issue where Starro is attacking the Earth, and this is leading to the formation of the Crime Syndicate. And so that's what I'm excited to know about is how is the invasion of Starro, Starro's invasion of Earth, going to lead to the creation of the Crime Syndicate? Because we know that. Starro's invasion of Earth on Earth designated zero led to the formation of the Justice League. So how is writer Andy Schmidt going to go about doing that? And and it was, you know, I, I will say that I was hoping for a little a few more Easter eggs here. But I, I do appreciate the fact that right off right off the bat at Arnold, Arnold, D.C., not Washington, D.C., but at Arnold, D.C., Starro is, is attacking the president, Oliver Queen and uh, Superwoman Donna Troy is is battling Starro's and and even a secret uh, Secret Service agent uh, Selena Calabrese, uh, Catwoman is um, a Secret Service agent. I missed that last issue. It had to be brought to my attention. 
and and Owl Man. I really I like to focus on Owl Man this issue. He's he's just as smart as Batman, and of course he's his of course he's Thomas Wayne, and his his brother Bruce Wayne and his parents were were murdered uh, by the by the Gordon crime family. <laughs> As you, we discover in the backup, and we see the connections that, and and he's got a scar from an owl, and and that, so Thomas Wayne has this permanent scar on the right side of his his eye, uh, which is you know that that formative that formative scene where Batman becomes Batman with the bat crashing through the window. Well, of course, for Thomas Wayne, naturally it had to be an owl, and so a lot of these things there. They might seem a little bit tropey and a little bit cliche, but they're fun. And that's what I look for in, in, in the crime syndicate. But also there's there's a degree of realism here that uh, or I guess verisimilitude for the circumstances that I quite enjoy. I love the cockiness of Ultraman and Superwoman as as Ultraman is possessed by Starro and he's 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 demanding that, that Superwoman comply. And of course, she's an Amazon from Earth three and. And one gets the one gets the impression that Diana, Diana of Earth Three is is dead and maybe has been honored by Donna Troy, uh, because she makes reference to Diana late, later on in, in the issue. But in any event, the Donna Troy man, Superwoman, great battle scene between Ultra Woman and, and Donna Troy, and ultimately Atomica and uh, Johnny Quick show up with the Emerald Knight, which is. Uh, Owl Man pieces together that the Emerald Knight is the that the rings of the Emerald Knight are the arch enemies of Starro, and they all meet up at the end on the lawn on the front lawn of the of the White House, <laughs> and uh, I, I enjoyed it for what it was worth. And I, I really think that if these first two in issues are any indication, I think this is going to be a real fun trade to read. I have a feeling that these first six issue these six issues when when, when all is said and done. I think this is going to develop a cult following. I certainly hope so. And the art, I thought, really worked. The art uh, art by De Dexter McEwen did a good job in the art. Color, Steve Olive, Letter of Rob Lee. They, just a great job. I, I was entertained. Not as good as the first issue. I thought the first issue packed, packed a little bit more bang for my buck. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more Easter eggs in the second issue. But maybe I missed them. Maybe I missed some. But I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of teasing of other heroes and how this world's a little bit different. But overall, I, I have to say I'm still, I'm still, it still put a smile on my face. <laughs> that's fair enough. That, that, that's interesting. I actually, so I actually found this issue to be better than, than the first one. Um, but I get, I get your point. I think that the, the first issue was a little more fun. There was a little more, it was a little more tongue in cheek. Um, this issue sort of took itself a little more seriously, uh, which I thought was okay. Um, you know, and, and maybe part of the reason that I enjoyed this issue more was just knowing that this really is supposed to be a new version of these characters. So, you know, coming at it from that perspective, I'm not so quick to say, well, wait, that's not how Ultraman would act, or that's not, um, you know, the way Superwoman is. Uh, you know, it's not the Superwoman we know. It's not Lois Lane. It's it's Donna Troy. So uh, these are these are different characters, and I do appreciate that we're seeing them uh, maybe form the the crime syndicate. You mentioned it yourself with uh, with Starro having been at the uh, heart of the Justice League. Uh, you know, in the original uh, DC universe, uh, Starro being the impetus that brought them together. So uh, I, I do appreciate that. Maybe the reason I like this. Uh, version better as I, like you said, it focused on Owlman. And I think that's the character that Andy Schmidt is getting the most, not necessarily uh, authentic in terms of him being like he, he was previously, because I sort of think previously the, cause I'm a big crime syndicate fan. And to me, Ultraman has always been the, the leader of that team, you know, maybe not the smartest guy, but he was the undisputed leader of that team. And Owlman was always sort of in the background, you know, sort of similar to different eras of the Justice League where uh, Batman was not only was he a member of the Justice League, but part of the reason he was a member of the Justice League was to keep an eye on everybody else. Right. Like we know he had different contingency plans for if Wonder Woman went rogue or Superman went rogue. So not only was he there to help them with whatever uh, world threatening uh, events or villains might be going on, but he was also there to sort of keep his eye, you know, uh, he was playing both sides. Um, and may, that's kind of how I, I got that same feeling with, with what the owl man used to be in, in the 
a version of the crime syndicate that I'm used to. I'm I'm this I'm is... going to ask you a question. I I thought in the in the backup the Owlman story that was beautifully illustrated by Brian Hitch. I thought it was a little bit. I thought I, I thought it was a little bit surprising that Owlman seemed to have the same same morality as Bruce Wayne, Batman, or on our Earth or Earth Earth Zero, Earth One, or whatever. But it, it, I thought he sort of he didn't about face to suddenly decide to kill. I, I, I found it very, very abrupt. I, it never really felt like it was, uh, you know, because he seemed to, he seemed to, he finally caught Harvey Bullock, who was involved, that, that was involved in the murder of his parents. And Harvey Bullock tells him that his parents were the ones that, uh, they, they killed Jim Gordon, you know, Boss Jordan's, uh, Boss, <laughs> Boss Gordon's son, Jimmy Jr., Jimmy Gordon. And, and he basically discovers that his parents were, in fact, cr crime syndicate members. And and rather than react like normal people would react, he suddenly decides he's going to be a killer. And and it, I just thought that was a little bit odd. I mean, interesting, but I would have liked to have seen. I'd actually like to have an Owlman origin flushed out a little bit more than the abruptness that I read in the backup. But I guess I guess we'll have to have to settle for it. But I, I'd be curious what you thought about that. Yeah, I thought it was kind of it, it, a very, a very like you said, abrupt. I mean, he didn't have a lot of pages to, to flesh it out. And as far as I remember, and, and I, I could be mistaken here, but as far as I remember, the, the Owlman origin previously, of, you know, of the previous Owlman, he was just all, like, he was aware, even at a young age, that his parents were on the wrong side of the law. And when they got killed, he, he just took it upon himself to kind of just crank it up to 11, if you will. Um, th this is very different. Like you said, he does share morality with, with Bruce Wayne, the Bruce Wayne of our world, where he's thinking he's going to be a hero. He's yeah. going to stamp out things. And then when he realizes that his parents were criminals all along, he sort of, uh, um, like you said, it's very abrupt. He immediately loses all faith in, in humanity and just decides, well, if they were bad and I come from them, then I must be bad. Everybody's bad. I'm just going to be a bad guy and go around and do whatever the hell I want. Cause nothing, nothing matters at that point. Like he just goes from, uh, the hopes of uh, kind of making a difference and making the world a better place to complete nihilism in, in an instant when he finds out his parents are, are criminals. So yeah, you're right. It was, it was very abrupt and it very well may be that Andy Schmidt would appreciate a chance to flesh that out well, more too. I, he just, he was really limited in the number of pages that they, that they had. Yeah, I, I do Especially suspect, with, I suspect that this owl man is less evil as, as the Jeff Johns counterpart. Cause I remember Jeff Johns in forever evil his Owlman origin, Owlman actually conspired and hired the hitman that would kill his parents and his brother. Uh, yeah. I mean, so he was a much more evil Thomas Wayne under the Jeff Johns Forever Evil incarnation. So I, I, I get the sense that, the, that the, there's, a, there's a little bit more of a connection to the good side on this crime syndicate than I would have normally believed. You know, I, I think, you know, maybe, maybe the exception is Ultraman, but I think Owlman is a little bit closer to... to you know, a little bit more on the, you know, he's still bad, but a little bit more on the good than if I compare him to past incarnations of Owlman. But. No, I think, I think it might, even with, I think that might be a true statement that these guys are more in the gray area than straight up evil, even including Ultraman, um, just based on, on, on what we're seeing. Uh, but, but one other thing that I'll mention about the, the owl in the light and an owl in the light story uh, that you mentioned uh, same writer and uh, Andy Schmidt, Brian Hitch, as you mentioned, does the artwork. Alex Sinclair and colors. Um, there is that word that gets used a lot with uh, with Brian Hitch's art. You know, it's cinematic. I, I would use letterbox. I think that's m more accurate. Uh, but he does tend to use panels that you know they 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 go all the way across the page. So that's another reason you know that he didn't they didn't have a lot of pages. I think it was only three or four pages long. And I think they do a great job in the space that they have. Uh, but even in the space they have with Brian Hitch's style of art, it, it kind of limits it even more with what you can do in, in that short amount of time. So for me, Owlman is far and away the most interesting character in this version of the uh, of the crime syndicate. And, you know, Superman being my favorite character, my crime syndicate favorite character was always Ultraman because, again, he was the leader. And there was something about him that he, he was a man of few words. You know, it was more about deeds, not words, to quote the very 
cheesy 80s 80s movie <laughs> megaforce you guys remember the cheesy movie with the poster deeds not words that was uh that was ultraman um whereas this ultraman that andy schmidt is giving us is is very much different he he's loquacious he's you know to go back to your point about maybe not being evil it's not even so much that he's necessarily evil he's just like a, an attention whore like he he just wants people to pay attention to him whether they're paying attention to him because he's doing good things or bad things he doesn't care he just wants the adulation he just wants the eyes on him and we saw that that's why he was confronting cat grant last issue he just wants people he wants to be important so it's a different sort of bad guy you know i would almost say he's kind of similar to um the homelander in the boys uh tv show that a, a lot of people would will know from the amazon show um that's how he comes across that's how he comes across in the comics as well just wants people paying attention to him whereas uh owl man in this version does seem e even more intelligent than the owl man of previous um in fact i love the line at the end when he shows up to all the other, I don't know, I won't call them heroes, but all the other characters and <laughs> the, uh, the, the ring that John Stewart's wielding says, who am I? He says, I'm the man with the plan. Um, so yeah. It, and this is, it's just a much different world. And that's not to say it's better or worse than the crime syndicate and the earth three that I'm used to, but it's just so different that it's a, a little bit jarring because we certainly have never seen this many heroes in that, uh, Earth before either in, in this big battle with Starro, there's all kinds of heroes showing up, uh, and it's a cool, it's a cool visual from, uh, uh, from the artist here from the art team, uh, uh, Vine or is, is it Vines? I keep remember, forgetting who, uh, who's uh, who did the, uh, the inks, right? I think, uh, yeah. So uh, McKeon, yeah, Dexter Vine. Uh, and McKeon. So McKeon's pencils and then uh, Dexter on, on, on the inks. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you see a lot of these different versions. Uh, we see um, the Firestorm analog. We see a, um, a Martian Manhunter analog, which I don't remember ever seeing before. We've seen the Firestorm analog before. It's called Death Storm. There's a, a, a Giganta analog. It looks like there's a, an Al Pratt Atom analog. These, these aren't... Um, or three characters that I remember seeing before. There's even an evil Hawkman. Um, I just don't remember seeing these characters, so I'm not sure who they are. But it, but it's interesting. It opens up um, interesting things. But for me, like I said, with it just not connecting, um, I think I, I'm going to put it down to to the difference in Ultraman. He's just so different, and he's always been my touchstone to the crime syndicate. So I, I'm just having a hard time getting my footing i mean he he talks a lot uh especially when he's fighting with with donna troy and and the fact that it's low uh, donna troy instead of lois lane and and their their fight and i get that they're trying to show that it's uh you know this knockdown drag out but that was the one part where the art didn't work for me because i think for the most part the art does work maybe with the exception of of the colors i'll talk about that in a second but they're trying to show how epic this this fight is and and how much ground it covers i mean they're on they're they're fighting in arnold dc and then they're up in space and then they're back on the ground but in trying to show that it the transitions aren't great from panel to panel there's a lot happening between panels here in terms of movement and whatnot and so i didn't think the transitions were uh were the best as opposed to the transitions when we get owl man's story uh, especially when he's talking to his version of of alfred it works really well um, that's the, 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 so the owl man part of the story, I think the creative team nailed it as opposed to the, uh, the Ultraman, um, Superwoman fight left me a little, a little cold. I was like, man, this well, just it, feels it, so. It's, been, it's very vanilla sky. Like I, I expected, I did expect more violence, uh, because it's the crime syndicate. I expected them to be more cruel and violent in their fighting tactics. And, but I mean, it's, I, I do think everything sort of like made it's almost like a pg version of really bad people because it's this is not an r-rated comic and, and of course i realize that it's it's rated for teen but i i would have uh I, I was expecting a little bit more hardcore uh, in the scenes maybe like I, again I'm, I'm nitpicking here but this is the crime syndicate and they're supposed to be more cruel they're supposed to be more you know 
they're, they're, they're supposed to be like the boys 10.0. I mean, they're, you know what I mean? They're supposed to be yeah. like really badass and, you know, maybe put on the good face and maybe even put on any cruel face for the world, but even be more cruel in, in private. But, uh, overall, I guess a mileage will vary on this title, but, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, I think there's so much to mine here and I can't wait to, I, I can't wait to see if there's more heroes and what have you. And, and what did Owlman do with all his villains? Like, are we going to see the Joker or the Riddler? Or how did Owlman deal with his rogues gallery? Because I have a sneaking suspicion that if he killed Harvey Bullock, <laughs> if he dropped Harvey Bullock from a, from a building to his death, I'm sure that is, he probably does, a, does not have much of a rogues gallery, but we shall see. Yeah, I mean, I thought Alfred referenced that in the first issue, saying that he killed all the super people in Gotham. So, uh, but yeah, I, I, I agree with you, you know, not, not to keep comparing this version of, of crime syndicate back to previous versions, but in forever evil, you know, that's not a, a comic that's labeled mature either, but they felt much more malevolent than they do here. But again, maybe Schmidt is going for something, something different. And if that, if that's the case, that's fine. Um, but I just don't think personally for me, we haven't, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about the book, uh, you know, I did mention the colors, I know Steve Olaf is a really a talented color artist. I don't know that I agree with the choice of the color palette. These aren't really bright primary colors. And I, I know I talk a lot about how bright primary colors really suit uh, a superhero book. And this is technically a supervillain book, but my, the point is still there. Like, I think if you brighten the colors up, it, it heightens the fact that this is a, I, I'll, I'll say a, a you know, a super being comic instead of a superhero comic. Um, and I think it would, it would make it a little more fun uh, and make the art pop a little more. So I do think that that's, uh, it's an interesting choice. I don't know that I agree with it. I would like to see brighter colors and maybe he's choosing to go with a more muted palette because this is earth three and it's a more cynical, you know, negative world where, you know, evil is good and good is evil. I get that. But I still think, at least for the origin story, it would have worked with a brighter uh, color palette. I think that would have worked better. But yeah. that's just, uh, like you said, your mileage may vary on that. Yes, and I, I don't want to apologize. Uh, people on the podcast won't see this, but on, on the thumbnail I did, I screwed up on the artist. I, it's, it's the, artist are, is, <laughs> the artist is actually Penciler's Kieran McEwen and the Inker's Dexter Vines. Colors to Steve Olaf. Uh, for some reason, I created a new person called Dexter McEw McEwen. I apologize <laughs> to the uh, creative team. <laughs> yep. All good. All good. Okay. Uh, well, let's, let's move on to uh, to Batman 107. Um, this is another book where I, man, it's almost there for me. Uh, but it just it falls down in, in a few places. So uh, anyway, written by James Tynan, the fourth, we have... Uh, Art by Jorge Jimenez, colors by Tomeo More, and letters by uh, by Clayton Cowles. Uh, sounds like you really enjoyed it, though, Rocky. What'd you think? Man, I, I'm enjoying James Tiny, man. I, I I love you know a lot of people. A lot of people are giving him a hard time because he's creating a new character every second issue. But I'm loving it, man. I, I he can bring it on. Bring bring on Miracle Monday. Bring on bring on all the characters you can because I'm I'm enjoying the plot line here. I'm really enjoying. I'm really a pleasant surprise. This issue is Ghostmaker, and I was actually. I was quite happy with the backup Ghostmaker. I can't believe how much I enjoyed it, uh, the Ghostmaker backup here. But but even the story, the story itself is, I, I was I actually thought that Future State maybe would, the Future State Batman stories, would taint these current mainstream stories because it, we, because we kind of know where it's headed, but that hasn't happened here. I'm actually curious. I mean, this this issue starts off with. Uh, it's been one month since uh, Arkham Asylum Day, a day when uh, Arkham Asylum was taken down, uh, w basically where there was the the Joker gas attack, and and Batman dealt with that. And here we're dealing with the Unsanity Collective, and the Unsanity Collective is is led by this person by the name of Master Wise, and and there's a lot of fear being going through Gotham City. The Scarecrow is presumed dead. People of Gotham are filled with fear. Batman's act, Batman is pretty sure Scarecrow is still alive because Batman sees he, he figures out that it's actually a body double that was in Arkham Asylum in, in Scarecrow's cell and that it wasn't really Scarecrow. And he's actually impressed with Scarecrow because Scarecrow isn't using any of his fear toxin. He's just the people of Gotham City are still just they're just plain scared from the from the fallout of the Bane 
from the from the from the from Bane and the Joker war, and they're genuinely uh, afraid. And so while Batman's investigating, I love we get we get Commissioner Montoya. She's the new commissioner. Of course, we know that Commissioner uh, the former Commissioner Gordon is now off. Uh, Looking for the Joker in 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 the Joker series, which uh, you and I both uh, we love that opening issue, and here we have we we, we get this uh, we get Harley once again trying her best to trying her do her best Robin impression by being a sidekick to Batman, but she's never really beside Batman when she tries to help him out, <laughs> and she's she's doing her best to help help uh you know clear crime off the streets. Unfortunately, she gets a uh, you know, mistaken by the police for just being part of the problem, not part of the solution. And Ghostmaker rescues her from from being arrested uh, for suspicion of contributing to another psychopath's activity. And uh, it it's interesting. There's there's this new there's this new character with a red suit who has a red rose, and she's got these two plant dogs. I don't know if the, the name of the character is unclear, but it's. Uh, it's it's a it's a new it's a female black character in a red suit holding a red rose and it's like she's accompanied by two dogs they look like dogs made of plants and leaves and I'm not sure if that's if the if if this is a new is this a new sort of like poison ivy related like character I'm not sure what it is but I'm curious because she was spying on Harley and so there's interest it's interesting in that respect it's also it's also been revealed that we got twelve new bat signals now Oracle. Barbara Gordon has revealed that because Batman doesn't have a good relationship with Gotham's Gotham PD anymore, he can't have his they can't have the bat signal on top of the police headquarters. So now they have they have rotating 12 rotating bat signals on different on different uh, buildings scattered all across Gotham. And, and the bat signal, once they use it, they'll move it to another building. So they, they want to stay mobile and they want to make sure that the people of Gotham know that they know that they can feel safe. And it's uh, this all leads to Batman wanting to infiltrate the Unsanity Collective because he thinks that the key to what it, what what is going wrong is with the Unsanity Collective, and this is all connected. the this the Unsanity Collective is led by Master Wise, who is who who it, I I think Scarecrow is related to that. We've got Simon Saint with the Magistrate Program. He wants the Magistrate Program to become successful and 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 he's utilizing the the one there's that one guard that Batman saved and I forget the guard's name uh but he was he was saved in the pages of uh uh he, he's the one guard that's going to become peace peacemake peacekeeper one and that that particular guard uh what's I'm trying to remember I'm trying to get his name here uh Sean Mahoney he's going to become peacemaker one Simon Saint is experimenting on him to become the next Peacemaker One. We know that. And all this stuff is coming to a head. And we're at the early stages of, and we know how this is going to end up in Future State. But I don't know. This is one area where I think all the pieces are coming together. And I'm enjoying piece, putting the pieces together at the beginning. And I'm enjoying it. And then how can you, how can you not love Matches Malone, man? I'll, whenever, whenever Batman goes undercover to see Matches Malone, infiltrate the to go down to the Gotham City Narrows to infiltrate the Insanity Collective because it's it consists largely of a bunch of homeless Gotham people that make up the strength of the Insanity Collective and matches Malone is back and he's got this cool outfit that kind of has glow in the dark lining I think I think the art here was great Jose Yemenes did a fantastic job in the art I thought the mood was great I mean I don't know I'm enjoying this man tell tell me I'm wrong why? Why the hell does Matches Malone look like Jim Gordon? I was. It was so confusing. It doesn't look like Ma Matches Malone has ever looked. He has. Matches has always had dark hair. This guy's got red. I, I did. I was like, is that Jim Gordon? Look, it's supposed. To, it says my name's Match, not Matches. I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't understand that. Yeah, and the outfit was weird. Why is it glowing? I. I. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I've said before that. I, I get what Jorge Jimenez is trying to do. This is a much more visceral type of art. It's it's more scratchy. It's it's more uh, impressionist as opposed to cleaner art I've seen him do before, like on Justice League. So it's not my favorite, but you know, it, I guess it works for for this book for the most part, uh, and the colors work well um, because you know it makes no sense that he has this jacket that has glowing uh, lapels and whatnot, but 
<laughs> it looks cool. It looks cool. Uh, but yeah, it really threw me. I didn't know why he looked like Jim Gordon. That's it's just weird. Um, but what you had said uh, right at the start there, we were talking about we know where this is going, and you were worried that it was gonna kind of ruin things for you. But it but it hasn't. It has for me. Um, what I find myself constantly thinking is if I hadn't read any of Future State, if I didn't know about Magistrate and all the peacekeepers and the mess that Gotham becomes, I would be much more invested in this story. But because I know the end result or a possible end result, um, I'm, I don't care. Um, Simon Saint is an, a mystery to me. I know he's going to create a fascist police force as opposed to had that not been done, there would be more mystery there. I'd be more engaged. So this isn't really working for me that well. The other thing that really bugs me is, so the Joker was always it when it came to Batman villains, right? As much as I don't like him, and I think if there really were a true Batman and a true Joker, Batman would beat him in 30 seconds and we'd never hear from the Joker again. He doesn't have any actual superpowers. He hasn't trained himself to the peak of human perfection the way Batman has. Um but then we've had various writers come along over the years and they decide, hey, some of these other characters, rogues, villains of Batman need to be leveled up too so they can actually challenge Batman. And this all has to do with the power creep of Batman himself over the years. Like you have to constantly, as Batman gets more uh, adept and, and more capable, you've got to increase the power level of his villains. That's the problem with all these writers constantly making Batman better and smarter and, and whatnot. And we saw it with the Riddler, right? Especially with what uh, Scott Snyder did, making the Riddler so much smarter. Now it feels like Tynan is doing that with the Scarecrow. And I, I just don't care for it. I just want these characters to be the characters that they are. And now all of a sudden it seems like it's not even, the impression I got in this issue, it's not even Simon Saint that's behind the Magistrate. It's not Simon Saint that has anything to do with it. It's all the, the Scarecrow pulling the strings. But that doesn't make any sense with what we saw in the Harley Quinn future state story where Scarecrow, Jonathan Crane himself was, was, you know, much lower level. So it's not making sense to me. Um, I don't understand why all of a sudden the Scarecrow is so formidable and uh, it's it just, yeah, it's, it's not working. Um, the other thing I didn't like was, well, I, I guess it's okay. The, the Harley Quinn stuff, this is a Batman book, but, Harley is featuring prominently in here. And the thing about it is, is, is she, based on who's uh, writing Harley, her, uh, and we'll talk about it. Well, I guess we're not going to talk about the, the Man Bat book, actually, um, which is fine. But Harley's dialect, <laughs> the way she talks, the way some people write her, they script her in her dialogue. They try to write it as though she's talking with that Brooklyn accent, and some people don't. And her, she's in so many books, you know, she's in Suicide Squad, she's in this book, she's in Harley Quinn, and then we have other Black Label Harley Quinn books, like um, the, the Criminal Sanity book and the, uh, the uh, Sean Gordon Murphy verse book. And can we just, she doesn't necessarily have to have the same personality, but can we get her to at least talk the same? Because it's so, <laughs> like, you know, I know it's a nitpicky thing, but it throws me every time. She doesn't even seem like the same character, not even close, even in books that are supposed to be in the same, like, I get it. Like if she talks differently in, in criminal sanity or uh, the uh, Sean Gordon Murphy verse, then fine. That's fine. Cause those are black label books and they're completely separate. But when she talks differently in the Batman book versus in the Harley book versus the suicide squad, it just, I don't know. There's no consistency there. And it, and it kind of bugs me. Um, also, you mentioned about uh, Tynan introducing new characters. We got we got this uh, African American woman smelling a rose with these um, like I don't know what are they goats or something that are, look like they're made out of yeah. plant life. <laughs> yeah. who, who, goats who or the dogs heck? or deer? Yeah, I don't know what they are. Or Dobermans. Who, I, do you I, have I any know. idea? Do you have any idea who this woman is? I, I no. I... I, I don't, I mean, of... I, I never, I, I haven't cheated and looked at future solicits, so I'm sure somebody out there knows, but, uh, but I, I, yeah, I don't know. So you're, yeah, you're right about Tynan introducing, you know, it feels like he's introducing so many characters. He's like throwing all these characters at the wall just to see who sticks. <laughs> um, I don't know. It, it, it it's kind of weird. What, one thing that I, is working really well for me 
Barbara Gordon back as Oracle and her relationship and the way her and Batman interact works really well for me. Um, so it's not, it's not terrible, but yeah, I think if I didn't know anything about magistrate, if I didn't, if we hadn't gotten that glimpse in the future, this would be working much more for me. Although the fact that Tynan's trying to level up Scarecrow still would bug me. Um, so yeah, it, it, this it's okay. It's okay. Um, the backup feature with, uh, with the ghost maker, you mentioned how much you, you really enjoyed it again. I thought it was okay. Um, the artwork, it's, it's very similar to Jorge Jimenez artwork. The artwork's done by Ricardo Lopez Ortiz. It, it's written by Tynan, same as uh, the main feature, same colorist, Tomeo More, same letterer, Clayton Cowles. Uh, but Ricardo Lopez Ortiz art, it, it feels like he's trying to channel um, Jorge Jimenez here, but it's even more scratchy and maybe a little manga influenced. And I, I didn't I didn't care for the art. It's it's a little too stylized and a little too rough for my taste. So what, what did you uh, what did you think of Madame Midas? <laughs> yeah, super over, on earth. Yeah, super over the top. Whatever, uh, she's fine. I mean, the whole story is over the top. I mean, the fact that he has this giant plane that apparently is like artificial intelligence kind of thing. It kind of reminds me of. Um, Iron Man with the whole Jarvis thing or Friday or whoever in his armor that he that he talks to this custom built radar invisible it says it's a jet fighter it's a ghost yet, stream he calls it the ghost stream yeah yeah but yet it has its own like bedroom with marble pillars and a giant bed and apparently he's <laughs> just finished having sex with a, a man and a woman no he doesn't think of it as sex he calls it meditation he calls meditation, it like meditation what what you know whatever it is and is he is he blind i mean <laughs> He always has his eyes covered, even here. Uh, he's blindfolded. Hey, I know we just finished having meditation, but here's this giant feast. It, it's super over the top. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so I, 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 I don't know. Th this, And I, I'd be fine with it, except for the fact that because this is a retcon character, right? We're supposed to believe this guy has been around just as long as Batman has with all of this technology and all you know this is not a jet fighter this is a giant flying <laughs> bat cave basically you know i mean I, i'm not kidding he has marble pillars in the bedroom that has this giant bed with a giant screen tv that where he's just had meditation with these two people it's just too over the top for me it's too it's too unbelievable like i so well, I, whatever i, I, I started I started out liking the ghost maker and now I just kind of want him to go away. <laughs> oh man. I, I, I so disagree with you on that, man. I, I think he's such a breath of fresh air to me. He's like Bruce Wayne unfiltered. He's Batman unfiltered, man. He's, he's Batman without the, without the hangups and the darkness and the angst. And he's got the money on top of it to do whatever the hell he wants with it. And he, you know, he meditates a lot. <laughs> and uh, he just he, feels like a, he, he just feels like a Tony Stark ripoff to me at this point. Well, I think it, I think that he might even be that to a certain extent, but but I love the fact that he's got all these other villains and that he's got his own rogues gallery that very few people have ever heard of because very few people have ever known who the ghost maker is and where the ghost maker is and what he's done. And he's done a lot of heroic things we're probably not aware of and probably some not so heroic things. So he's got some elements of mystery. And you want to talk about uh, Tinian's inclination to create new characters I got to read these off here. He created four new characters here as well. The, uh, the into the inst instigator, a magically transformed martial artist and terrorist, Razor Line, who is unspeakably otherworldly horrific, Kid Kawaii, a feral fluid assassination robot, and Brainstorm, a genetically engineered telekinetic, <laughs> who are the enemies of Ghostmaker. As Ghostmaker is found out where they are. He doesn't. He he knows he's being lured there as a trap. Madam Midas, the richest woman on earth, is pissed off at him because she's she loses. She she costs he costs her 114 billion dollars and she makes a million dollars a second and she's really pissed off. And you know I'm I'm reminded of something Tinian said in his new in his third newsletter to fans. He he believes he said that he wanted to keep his storytelling. He 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 wanted to keep it simplistic. And he thinks sometimes storytelling gets too complex with the organic storytelling. And this is me reading into that, but 
I think this is Tinian's response to that. This is him keeping it simple. This is a uh, this is an action hero, perhaps maybe an anti-hero slash fun character, and he's writing it that way. And I actually I'm enjoying this for what it is. You know, when we want the more serious, brooding kind of darkness kind of guy, we got Batman. Batman does this kind of stuff too, but Ghostmaker has a sense of humor. And frankly, Ghostmaker is the guy. He's more like I think he's more like all of us. Because I have to admit, I'd probably more in, be more inclined to in, enjoy the high life a little bit more like Ghostmaker as opposed to Bruce La Wayne, who only seems to pretend to enjoy the high life, despite the fact that he ought to. But <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it definitely seems like Tynan's trying to have some fun here and, uh, you know, more power to him. But yeah, like I said, he feels like a Tony Stark ripoff. And he, one thing you failed to mention about this this magically transformed martial artist and terrorist, the instigator, he, he's an alligator. <laughs> it's like that bad joke, you know. What do you what do you call an uh, a, a private investigator who? Uh, no, what do you call a detective who's a who's an alligator? What do you call an alligator detective? An investigator, you know. This guy's the insta hyphen gator. Although he didn't put the hyphen in there, it's it's like really, dude. Um, uh, okay, I guess. I, I guess he's trying to have fun with it. Like I said, more power to him. It's not really working for me. But the, the thing is, he does just enough in each issue to go, okay, you know what? I'm going to give it one more. I'm going to give it one more issue. I'm going to give it one more issue. And, and in this issue, it was the um, the scenes with Batman and Oracle that got me to hang around for one more. So I guess we'll see what 108 brings. I wouldn't want to miss out on 108 since it's the debut of Miracle Molly. And uh, that's right. Uh, the spec market's going wild, my friend. <laughs> had, I mean, I, he's got four here, plus the, the lady in, in red with the plant goats. Um, we got Clown Hunter. We, we got Ghostmaker. Um, the Underbroker, was that him also? Yeah. Yeah. Underbroker. And then, that. yeah. And then who was who was the first guy that turned out to, to be the Joker? The, it wasn't oh, the, the planner. The designer? The designer? The designer, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so yeah, he's certainly making new characters left and right every issue, it seems like, so. Yeah. All right, so we'll uh, head off to Su Suicide Squad issue two? Yeah, Suicide Squad issue two. Um, again, it's just another one of these titles where I just didn't enjoy the the, the second issue as, as much as the first, although I feel like there was a less drop off on this one from the, the first to the second issue. So uh, written by Robbie Thompson, pencils by Eduardo Pansica, inks by Julio Ferreira, colors by Marcelo Maiallo, letters by Wes Abbott. Um, it's just the <laughs> having Connor Kent as a member of the Suicide Squad is really what is throwing me. Why, like why if he's supposedly infected with some sort of liquid kryptonite that's killing him. He's got any number of heroes that he could go to to try to be saved. Why he would make a deal with Amanda Waller is what I what I don't understand. And, and we do see kind of the fallout of this here where he doesn't want to do what Peacemaker's telling him to do. He wants to stay back and be the hero like he always is. And Peacemaker, I've never known Peacemaker to be strong enough to punch out Superboy, but uh, I, I think the explanation they give here is that his uh, the the kryptonite that's infected in Superboy is making him weaker. So I guess I can sort of buy that. Um, but it does show the ruthlessness of Amanda Waller, where you know once Superboy's knocked out, she basically uh, eliminates or or disables the masks, the gas masks of a couple of the other members of the Suicide Squad, so they die. So that when Superboy comes to back at the headquarters of of Suicide Squad. They can basically say, uh, they being Peacemaker and, and Amanda Waller can basically say, see, uh, Superboy, you didn't follow orders, and now people on our team died. So totally despicable. You would expect no less from Amanda Waller. Um, it just, it's, this is so, such a different take on Peacemaker than I've ever seen before. He's much more malevolent. Um, and you got to, think like rocky and i've said a bunch of times that the whole even the whole reason he's in this book is because he's in james gunn's suicide squad movie but he he's not the leader of of the suicide squad in that movie and he doesn't even from what we've seen in the trailers 
he seems to be more of a um kind of a, a a strong but not very smart character the way we've seen him portrayed in the in the uh, trailers by john cena so it doesn't even match up with what we're seeing here where he's he's very manipulative and and sort of calculating um but i did think that this overall was was a pretty good story and we, we got a couple of uh, of new characters speaking of uh, and a couple of them didn't survive the issue and you know a couple of them did and they're they were i found them to be pretty pretty interesting especially the culebra uh, alejandro cortez she's super strong she's invulnerable she's an unstoppable force she's yeah. extremely powerful but her attempts at humor create useless distractions i thought she was, she was one of the best parts of the book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she was. She was funny. I was good. She was funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so my, Mind Ward didn't did not survive, um, nor did Exit, um, but uh, Nocturna did, which we've seen her uh, before. So all in all, I thought it was it was solid. Um, as much as I don't care for uh, Amanda Waller, the, the biggest question I have here is just the whole involvement of like who decided to put. Superboy in a Suicide Squad book, um, but this th this is a case where the second issue I thought was, um, you know, just a very slight drop off uh, from the first, which I thought was was pretty good, and I'm I'm actually thinking that I'm going to be picking up issue three just based on on what happened in this issue, uh, and a big part of it is just because I love Talon, uh, and so I'm curious to see we haven't gotten any any characterization of him yet from Robbie Thompson. So I'm curious, curious to see where that goes. Uh, I do find it, I don't want to say self-serving, but uh, the fact that we're going to go and try to recruit um, a, a flash. Now, is that, who is that flash? Do you know? You know, well, it's, it's the flash that, uh, that is a member now, I believe of Tit Titans Academy. Cause that's where, that's where the third issue takes us is in Titans Academy. I'm not right, sure. I, no, I, I don't yeah. know what the name of the student is. No, I, I would have to go back and, and look, but uh, it's it. Yeah. And she doesn't even have, at least on one of her legs, she doesn't even have a lower leg. She has one of those prosthetic blades. So I'm, 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 I'm going to hang around. I'm going to hang around for another issue uh, of this. Cause I, I, di I did enjoy this. I, and I also thought the art was, was done really well. Eduardo Pansica's pencils. Um, with maybe the exception of the the peacemaker punch to Superboy, uh, and I get what he was trying to do, but I just don't think it works. Superboy is not um, Plastic Man or or uh, or Clayface, um, so I think the exaggeration of the the skin there just it didn't it didn't quite work for me. But <laughs> yeah, but but overall, I thought I thought this was pretty good. Um, Kulabra, I thought was a highlight. Like you said, she's she she's pretty damn funny. Um, so I liked it. Yeah, no, what do you think? I, yeah, well, definitely the, 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 some of the funniest moments are with, uh, are with, uh, Kulubra, I guess, or Kulub, Kulebra and strong and vulnerable and not very, not very funny, but yet is very funny at her attempts at the very humor she's trying in vain to, to create. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I actually really enjoyed Peacemaker in this issue. I, I thought this character worked for me because, uh, you know, it's funny you said, are you familiar with Peacemaker? Because I've never read a lot of Peacemaker before. I've even got the original. Uh, I've even go back. There, I've not read a lot of Peacemaker ever, really. I mean, I got he showed up in the Vigilante series. I got his four issue series back. He's he's I find him more interesting in this one issue than I've ever found Peacemaker. And I like the fact there are so many things that are contradictory about Peacemaker here. He's a former diplomat named Christopher Smith, yet he believes in peace at any cost. And one of the very first comments he makes is about William Cobb. He's pissed off that he's they're at Arkham Asylum on A-Day. This just happens to be there on A-Day, which is a rather remarkable coincidence. This is how everything's tied in. They're actually there on A-Day when the Joker gas is released. Coincidentally, they're there to rescue William Cobb. Ironically, they're replacing William Cobb's body with a corpse to fool Batman. Yet we just finished re reviewing Batman 107, where Batman thinks that there's another corpse that replaced Scarecrow. So I'm not sure if does Batman know that there's actually two bodies that were replaced in Arkham Asylum. But I guess that's an issue for another day. But everything's connected here. But in any event, Peacemaker makes the comment about William Cobb. He calls him a piece of human garbage. 
And then he turns around and says, yeah, but psychopaths are hard workers. And he needs William Cobb on his A-game because they need to get the hell out of Arkham and they try to escape. And then they're, they're about to get overwhelmed. And I don't know about you, but I was stunned that that how you want to know how Peacemaker is, is different than other members of the squad. He actually tells Waller, you know, blow up my head, blow up my brain, you know, take them out with me. William Cobb can escape. You know, you can use exit to teleport, you know, uh, you know, to portal everyone out. You know, he's willing to take one for the team like you, you know, well, he said it himself. What's that? He says right at the beginning, there will be, he said it himself, there will be peace or there will be death. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, I, and I do agree with this is the, maybe the most interesting take on Peacemaker because he's always been sort of unhinged, but never to this, this level. His insanity has been dialed up by Thompson, but also kind of his, uh, his intelligence as well. You know, he, like you said, he showed up in vigilante and he just seemed unhinged. Um, he has that level of, of craziness more than he's had, at least in the mini series that I, I haven't read obviously everything he's done. And if you go back and read his, his really old Charlton stuff, he's much more tame, but that's, you know, from a different era. Um, but, sorry. But I mean, e even the way, but w when he, when he hit uh, Connor Kent, I mean, that, that to me was in keeping with his, his, just his, his almost vitriolic, uh patriotism you know how dare you get in the way of of me fulfilling of a mission of finding peace and and stay the hell out of my way and you know so that's why i think that worked for me and it, it also established that that fist that that fist from peacemaker to connor kent's face that establishes the rapport on the team in other words there really isn't a rapport it's always it's always problematic when you talk about the suicide squad and that's why i'm so interested in this and I say again, we know from Future State that William Cobb doesn't, doesn't, you know, he becomes the Batman. And ultimately, what's really odd here is we know that Amanda Waller has a, has a plan. Her secret plan is to make Connor Kent the Superman of Earth 3. That's where this is supposedly all beheading, beheaded for. And I, I'm, st I'm still really curious. Now, I know it's an open question, is the Future State stories that we read are those those stories aren't necessarily written in stone, but they almost kind of have to be in a way because I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the agenda of Amanda Waller would be. But then I have to admit, I'm not sure why she'd want to end up. How is this pr current, you know, breaking William Cobb out? How is this relevant to going to Earth 3? And we also know that in Earth 3, ultimately, Amanda Waller ends up betraying Peacekeeper. <laughs> who I think ends up dying in Earth 3. So we know, we kind of know the endings here. And, but yet I still find myself extremely fascinated by this, by these character arcs, even if I know how the characters might end up. And I have a sneaking suspicion there's going to be a wrench thrown into it. And we're not going to end up with that future, that future state ending. Something's going to happen. But in any event, I'm, I'm happy with, I'm happy with this story. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting when you think about Amanda Waller. She's always been, you know, her mission's been, hey, I'm going to protect the United States at any cost. That future state story th throws her in a completely different light. She's she's manipulating whole planets, whole realities uh, at that point, you know? And, and that's my my whole thing about her just being a supervillain at this point. Yeah. So I'm, I'm still I'm still ready for her to go away on on every level. So we, we have to give we have to give a shout out to the pulp fiction reference in this comic. Huh? The Alma Thurman, you know, she revives Superboy with a needle, just like in Pulp Fiction. Yeah, yeah and uh, and 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 leave it to uh, Calebra to 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 make the to make the reference. You want me to Uma Thurman? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's great. It's the humor is is pretty good here. So kudos to Robbie Thompson. I I thought that the dialogue, I you know, might have been a little bit over and top uh, over the top in parts, but. I think if you're going to have that type of over the top dialogue, why not for Suicide Squad? Because I think it works here more than any other title. All right. Well, let's go ahead and move on to uh, the Swamp Thing. Uh, I don't think we mentioned it. I don't know that I knew uh, when we talked about the first issue that it was at, this is actually a, a mini series. There's only going to be um, a 10 issues. So this is the, the second, yeah, the second of 10. It's written by Ram V. Art is by uh, Mike Perkins. 
The colors are by Mike Spicer and the letters are by uh, Aditya Bidikar. And, uh, you know, I talked about how great the character work and the, the scripting was in the first issue. There's no change in that. They're both done very, very well here as well. Um, and this this does pick off pick up right where the the first issue left off with uh, Levi Kamel, uh, who apparently has become infected with the new uh, or with the swamp thing, uh, that you know Avatar of the Green and whatnot. Um, and so it's it's paced well, it's plotted well, the art is solid. Uh, not necessarily the cleanest Mike Perkins art I've ever seen, but it definitely works. Um, all that being said, this is my this is my last issue of, of Swamp Thing. Um, he, I, I'm just not a Swamp Thing guy, and there's not enough here that that interests me. I'm sure that uh, a lot of people will be like, "What? What are you? What are you talking about? Ram V? He's he's firing on all cylinders." It's very good dialogue. It's very good character work. I you know can just repeat everything I said in uh, in the first uh, about the first issue. It, it's a very technically well done comic. I just don't care about this character. I, I just don't. I don't care about Swamp Thing. I don't care about him being in the desert. I don't care about him fighting this oil monster with gold nugget eyes. It just, it, it, it did nothing for me. Um, it read fine. Uh, it, it didn't, it didn't drag, but I didn't feel super compelled to read it. And, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm jumping off after, uh, after two issues. So uh, well, what were your thoughts, Randy? I think if somebody was only going to read two issues of Swamp Thing, these first two issues tell one complete story in my mind. You, you This is a complete mm -hmm. story, these first two issues. And I think it's a really good one. And I think this is an excellent example. Well, I should watch what I say. I've never been a Swamp Thing guy. But I'm I'm definitely on board for this series. Or if it's only 10 issues, if, they, if all 10 issues are like this, I'm on board. You know, one of the themes of the first issue was that that you know this Levi Kama he's from Kami he's from in it's K A M E I I don't know how to s pronounce his last name Kami or whatever but anyways Levi I'll just call him Levi Levi is having dreams of the swamp thing or the dreams of the swamp creature he's from India and we know that we know that his brother released his brother was involved in releasing some sort of some sort of creature in India at some point and he keeps having these bad dreams of this pale wanderer in the Arizona desert. And meanwhile, the sheriff of this Arizona town, the Aztec town in the same area where this desert is, he wants to take out the pale wanderer. And there are, there are fathers. There's, there's themes here of parenthood of fatherhood. The sheriff himself has a disgrunt, has a bad relationship with his family. Hasn't seen his son in, in, in many years. Me, meanwhile, Levi, Levi, Levi's that father died in the first issue. And his dad forgave him. And one of the questions that, that was left dangling at the end of the first issue was, well, what, what, did, what does Levi's dad have to forgive him for? And, and I think, and it's, it's made, it's, it's not entirely clear, but it appears as if his father had to sort of forgive him, wanted to forgive him to, to free up Levi's guilt, to free up his guilt about maybe the circumstances surrounding his dad's passing. And so ultimately what we end up with here is where Levi keeps having these nightmares. He keeps dreaming about the pale wanderer and the pale wanderer keeps killing him. Keeps, keeps, he keeps witnessing the pale wanderer kill various people who end up in the Arizona desert, whether it's a camping family or a child or whatever the case might be. And ultimately he wants to stop the pale wanderer, but he's only able to stop the pale wanderer as the swamp thing after he's had a conversation with 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 his uh, his partner, his his lo lover, his girlfriend Jennifer, who basically helps him come to terms with why his father may have forgiven him, and I love the fact that she knows all his secrets. I like the fact that he's got a healthy, functional relationship with a woman in his life. It's not all dysfunctional. He's a he's he believes he's got he's got strong values. Levi, he's a good character. And he may have had some issues with his brother. He may have had an issue with his father that led to him, uh, his father forgiving him. But it was his girlfriend, Jennifer, that, that helped him find a kind of forgiveness and a letting go and an atonement that allowed his spirit to open up to finally be able to combat and fight against the pale wanderer at the end of the issue. And 
I thought it was beautiful. And and at the end of the issue, there's this beautiful bunyan tree, the Indian bunyan tree that appears in the middle of the desert after the swamp thing sort of expels the pale rider because the pale rider was saying to him, you're, you know, the good ideas endure. If you're really the best ideas I always endure. And as swamp thing, you must be a pretty bad idea because you don't get it. The pale wanderer resents Levi, re resents swamp thing because Le Levi embraces his humanity, whereas the pale wanderer abandoned his humanity uh, uh, to become the pale wanderer. Whereas Levi, despite the fact that he's all, he, he, he doesn't have any skin and bones anymore as the swamp thing, when he is the swamp thing, the pale wanderer resents that. How can you, why do you want to maintain humanity? I want to, I want you to join me and, and, and do and, 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 and spread hopelessness. But the swamp thing is the total opposite of that. And he's, he's, of course, he's uh, at the end, it says, I am the knowledge. I am the promise that even when, when things crumble, there is hope and there's that hope. And it's nice to see a, a Talking about hope, it's a DC comic, and, and we're getting it in Swamp Thing, not Superman. Can can you believe that? Wow. But yeah. Anyways, right, right. <laughs> but uh, anyways, I, I love the ending with the beautiful swamp with the beautiful bunion tree in the middle of the desert, and it's very interesting that it ends well, ends on a happy note, but it also ends with two people taking notice of the bunion tree, and that is Batman in the Bat Cave, which is interesting, and what I believe is the president of Prescott Industries who has something called the Alec Holland uh, Chronicles on his desk or something. Uh, so you know that the, you know that we're lovers of Swamp Thing and past Swamp Thing lore, lore with Alec Holland. I think that's going to come into play in future issues. I think that if you're a Swamp Thing fan, I can't imagine you wouldn't be excited for this series and where it might be headed. Yeah, I, I agree. If you love Swamp Thing, you're going to love this. Although I don't, it's not immediately clear. Just, I don't think Jennifer's his girlfriend because he refers to her in this issue just as her, a friend, as well as the first issue just as a friend. So well, I don't know. Maybe that's something. Doesn't he make her got. breakfast? Hey, I thought she was kind of wearing skimpy shorts there in that one scene, and she they were looking well, like her, they were having morning coffee or something. It's her that's apartment me. that he's, he's staying in. So <laughs> oh, I, I I don't know. It's, it's not it's not clear, but it definitely shows the strength of Ram yeah. V's uh, writing as his character <laughs> work for sure. Uh, I'd like to have a friend like that. I tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on. Uh, oh, I'm Green really Lantern. curious to hear what you thought about this. Yeah. This next one, uh, Green Lantern. So <laughs> yeah, this is written by uh, Jeffrey Thorne. We have Dexter Soy and Marco Santucci on art, Alex Sinclair on colors, Rob Lee on letters. And this is, um, a bigger, bigger issue. I think it's 20, 28 pages of, of actual story. Um, I mean, our, my preview copy says 31, but we have a couple of covers. So maybe it's 29 pages. So it's definitely a, a longer um, issue. So what, what, what were your thoughts on uh, Thorne's first Green Lantern? Well, you know, uh, we we know that Jeffrey Thorne he came under a lot of slack for he was very vocal about how he's not a big fan of Hal Jordan, and I I actually thought that he I don't think he disrespected Hal Jordan in this issue, he although he did sort of remove Hal Jordan's from the playing field, uh, and the focus of this story was on John Stewart and Simon Biet Simon Simon Biez and the Teen Lantern uh, Kelly, what's her last name? Kelly Quintana. Kelly Quintana, the, the, the Teen Lantern. And interestingly enough, she's 11 years old. I, I thought she was a little older than that, but so interesting age revelation for her. And this, this, this place, this is the type of storyline that has a plot line that I would have expected to have seen in the first year of Bendis' Superman because this involves one of the first meetings of the United Planets trying, and they're considering various other, they're considering Oa, for membership into the United Planets. And I really, I want to give Jeffrey Thorne some credit here because this was a, he raised some very interesting questions about the role of the Guardians in this new post-Omniverse DC universe. And they even talked about that, that the, the Guardians mentioned here that, you know, the Omniverse is still settling. Things are still settling into place. There's still a lot of open questions. And it is an open question, what role do the guardians of the Green Lanterns, what role do they play? Are they still the protectors of the various planets that might make up the United Planets? 
are the, do, do you still need a police force even? If you have a United Planets, do you need Green Lanterns? Do you need Guardians? These are sort of the outside questions that you can ask as you're reading it. And the various planets uh, from Daxim to, interestingly enough, I don't even think, I, I, don't, I didn't see Earth on there, but maybe that was, uh, maybe that was, uh, I don't know, maybe John Stewart. I'm not sure who was representing Earth. I would have thought I would have saw Lois Lane or, or Superman, somebody representing Earth, but I never did see anybody. Um, but in any event, I, it's interesting that, that you, you, one of the, the, the past of the Guardians came back to haunt them here because the Guardians want, they're asking for membership into the United Planets because they, they, and they're, they want to, various planets want support them, some don't. And in the midst of all this, you know, I think Jeffrey Thorne does a good job here and kudos to Dexter Soy and Marco Santusi, Colors by Alex and Claire. I thought the art here worked really well. I, if, I got one, if I got one criticism, I didn't recognize, I think a lot of the alien races, they, they never really did their homework. They never really delved into DC, his DC lore. I would have liked to have seen far more of uh, far more of the races in the DC universe that maybe we've seen traces of in the 31st century, and because it just looked like they were just drawing various animals, it looked like a sort of a a per man sketch of uh, the galactic Senate scene on on uh, from a Star Wars movie or something. But in any event, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more homework done on the on the alien races, but but I the the central question I thought was interesting. The, this sort of fairy tale creature that came, this f this uh, this Euridian is a master opener. This fairy queen and her, she's a fairy queen. She's a Euridian, and she resents the Owens, and she releases, she releases uh, something that uh, oh, I forget. They had a fancy name for it. They release the ant, the the at mat mat matritrim, the at matritrim. <laughs> I don't I can't even say it. Anyways, the yeah, source. A lot of, yeah, I think he picked some Scrabble tiles out of a bag when he came up with the name for that. Yeah, it, I, 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 that's always my pet peeve. I don't like when they do that. Uh, mind you, look, I'm, I'm the worst when it comes to pronunciation, so I'm, I'm, I don't mean to. I shouldn't point fingers, but whatever. But it's the the Owens at one point built this this power source for peace that basically destroy consumes all chaos and disorder, and. I th and ultimately, surprise, surprise, the way to defeat it at the end, John Stewart figures out, is to literally lay down your arms, you know, not fight. And, and that's how you defeat an enemy that anything that consumes all chaos and disorder is, well, just be orderly and be peaceful and you're not going to be in danger. And that's exactly how they end up defeating it. And they defeat the Fairy Queen. But unfortunately, the Fairy Queen, while she failed to get the star heart that was located in, in Oa, which basically would give more of their magics back to them. The uh, one of the terrorists ended up assassinating one of the guardians uh, right before they were accepted in, or right after they were accepted into membership in the United Planets. But overall, I thought it. I thought this this was an action-packed. This was an action-packed issue. We got to meet uh, Kelly Quinlan. Uh, we she she we saw Kelly meet a. a, a a Fusex, a, a quiet sail. It's a new alien creature called a, fu a Fusex. <laughs> Again, these, I, I'm, I, I really don't like the names that uh, Jeffrey Thorne is coming, coming out with here. Uh, but in any event, the character work I thought was decent. It was okay. I thought, I thought it was interesting. I, I, this is a good one shot. I'm, this is a good one shot. And I didn't see any hatred toward Hal Jordan. He was just off the playing field. I thought it really showed John Stewart's military capabilities well, his propensity for peace. I thought his his rapport with Simon ba 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 Baez and and even Teen Lantern showed very well. Overall, I thought this thing worked out, man. So, uh, what do you think? I hated it. <laughs> I absolutely hated it. I really did. It's one of the worst comics I've read in a while. Um, I, I don't understand why on the main cover. Uh, Kelly's head is as big as her body. <laughs> I, I like literally yeah. it, it's, it, it's terrible. Um, and then I, I, 
I didn't understand why we had to start in the middle of the story when every, all the shit is hitting the fan with uh, with John Stewart telling everybody fall back and oh drama bad things are happening. And then you know we get a couple pages with no context. We have absolutely zero idea what's going on. Teen Lantern is fighting um, Simon Baz. Damn, this kid, this kid has has stones. Okay, first of all, it's just the I thought the scripting, I thought that the dialogue was awful from Jeffrey Thorne. That's number one. Nobody says somebody's got stones anymore. You're it's from the '90s, dude. So <laughs> no, and she she doesn't have any stones. She's a girl. Okay, so I just just <laughs> there were just example after example after example of the scripting that just didn't work. That just pulled me out of the story and just showed that this guy doesn't have a handle on good good scripting. And it all could have been avoided if you just start at the beginning of the story. It didn't. I, I, you're trying to be clever and and hook us in, I guess, um, by starting in the middle of the big battle that eventually we we get to in the end. But it wasn't necessary. Just give us a straightforward narrative. I don't think that Jeffrey Thorne ha has enough um, experience at this point to, to do this properly. And he needs a lot of work on his, his scripting. Could he get there? Sure. I mean, he, he, he can tell a story. He's got good ideas. Um, but the execution is, for me, is where it's falling down. Uh, the Thanagarian character uh, is another example of... of bad scripting uh, in my mind she just comes across as very one-dimensional um and as far as Hal Jordan you're right he didn't come out and uh you know beat Hal Jordan down or say anything terrible about him but to me it felt like the whole reason that Hal Jordan was even in this book was was Jeffrey Thorne going look here's Hal Jordan he's in the book and I didn't disrespect him see I don't I don't dislike Hal Jordan I can set, I might dislike him as a fan, but as a writer, I can I can write Hal Jordan fine. It felt like an afterthought. It felt like it was shoehorned in here. Um, and, and when you juxtapose it against the way everybody's talking about Jon Stewart, everybody's talking about Jon Stewart in these glowing terms. Even the Guardians themselves. Jon Stewart, you're not like anyone else. You're the best. You're the greatest. You're our savior. You're going to save the universe. You're going to uh, bring peace to the whole galaxy. Like uh, we, we get it, Jeffrey Thorne. You like Jon Stewart. There's no need to beat us over the head with it. And that's how I felt at every turn on every page, every chance he got was telling us how great Jon Stewart is. Jon Stewart's the, the greatest hero in the DC universe. And it just, to me, that's just not true. Jon Stewart, it, it's just not true. Is John Stewart a great character? Yes. Does he have a lot of potential? Yes. Has he had a definitive run or series or something where I can point and say, yes, I know who John Stewart is? No. And if Jeffrey Thorne wants to do that, great, Jeffrey. Give us a definitive story. But hero worshiping John Stewart is not the way to do it. And that's what this felt like. This felt yeah. like an entire issue of hero worshiping John Stewart. So when you add that in with this really hokey dialogue uh, and, and I thought that Kelly was her personality. I don't know any 11 year old that would talk the way that she talks to adults. <laughs> like I just don't. Um, she's completely disrespectful. Um, I, 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 so she's completely unlikable. I didn't also understand why, why do the guardian, why are the guardians of the uh, universe not bald anymore? Do you have any idea why they all now have hair and there's female ones? I, I actually don't know. I I, I didn't yeah. even know that, that John Stewart used to be a guardian himself. Uh, nope, I didn't I didn't I didn't either. And I thought I yeah. had have pretty much read all the, the Green Lantern stuff. Yeah. So just again, problem after problem after problem. Um I, wow. I thought the art was was pretty solid. Um you can definitely tell there's two artists on here. I thought Santucci's work was a little better than um than Dexter Soy, just because it's cleaner. I prefer his style. Uh, the color work is consistent throughout, probably the best thing about the book. Uh, I thought that the, um, uh, the, the the characters from Planet Z, did he really call it Planet Xerox? Right? Isn't that what they, where these people are from, the, the, the sorcerers? Um, let's see, let me find it. Yeah. Yeah, you're from Xerox, right? Sorcerer's World. Um, yeah, yeah, I thought, yeah. I thought there again, their dialogue, he's trying to write it 
with a dialect where the main girl uh, sounds like she's Scottish or, or Irish or Gaelic or something, and it, it didn't come <laughs> didn't come across very well. Again, Kelly being very ab abrasive and disrespectful. So I, I, I don't know. There wasn't a lot in my mind to like here. Um, I, I thought he wrote Sinestro well. That might be the, the dialogue that worked the best for me. Um, yeah. He does have a handle on him. He's, you know, Sinestro is very over the top and uh, arrogant. And so I thought that was really well done. I also didn't understand why, and I was kind of surprised. It almost felt like ex deus machina, you know, God from the machine coming in to save the day. Stuart and, and everybody, they're all getting their butts kicked by this uh, unpronounceable monster's name. Um, and then this guy shows up and he almost looks like he's a white lantern, but Stuart just calls him citizen. Citizen, you need to evacuate. Oh, no, no. John Stewart, my knowledge may help you, Lantern. I've studied the book. Wait, so I, I can't believe maybe this is uh, Jeffrey Thorne trying to show us that uh, he, that John Stewart does. Look, I'm not a I'm not a John Stewart uh, sycophant. Look, because John Stewart even needed help from this random uh, Native American looking character in white who sort of looks like a white lantern. We don't get a name. And he's the one that tells John Stewart because it's all written in the book of Oa about before the Manhunters, the Guardians had created this at Manton um, at Mantonrim, uh, source of peace. Uh, and then John Stewart, with that knowledge, figures out, oh, the only way not uh, to win is not to fight. Uh, I don't know. Maybe Jeffrey Thorne has just seen war games one too many times. You know, the only way to win the game is not to play. You know, you can't you can't win at tic tac toe. So I, I, this was just bad on so many levels um, that I felt like after I finished reading it, I felt like Trevor, Dark Knight Nation. I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God, I'd be really curious to hear him. Re I, I, I mean, I, I feel like I'm being harsh uh, and I don't know Jeffrey Thorne personally. I'm sure that he he clearly loves uh, Jon Stewart and wants to make a good comic. And I want him to make a good comic. Nobody sets out to make a bad comic. Yeah. And I, like I said, I don't know him personally. I don't have anything against him. Um, and I'm sure he wants this to, to succeed, but man, this felt like a mess. Yeah. Um, well, and I, yeah, I just well, I got it, you know, like I say, uh, my friend that uh, we don't always agree and we're not agreeing on this. I, I, I can't, I, I don't feel this was a mess to me. I, 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 I absolutely, I, I appreciate your perspective on the, you, you have a legitimate point about, you know, John Stewart was definitely, they were, you know, they were definitely maybe forcing his, you know, his greatness and that that definitely came across and that seemed a little bit forced to me but if you but if you remove yourself from that i mean and also in fairness how many times has the guardian said that hell jordan was so special and uh, for multiple reasons and if in fact john stewart was a guardian at one point in the past i mean you can understand the guardians have maybe having some pr proclivities to you know uh I think an argument can be made. So that's not a hill that for me, it's not something that, that bothers me all that much. I, where, where I where the reason why I enjoy this more than you is that I think what bothers you a little bit more is maybe the character aspects of it. I, I think there's so much potential here for story that that's what I'm really focusing on. Because one of the things that Jeffrey Thorne identified in the plot is that he's drawn a connection between the rise of the Omniverse, the rise of the United Planets, and the rise of Teen Lantern, and he, the, the, you know, the Owens mentioned it, the Guardians mentioned that maybe there's a connection. Is there, it can't just be a coincidence, the rise of the Omniverse, this the United Planets, and then suddenly this, this you know, Cronas, it's not, it, there's this gauntlet on, on Teen Lantern that is not, that has its own power source. It's not powered by the Green Lantern battery. And they don't know what the power source is. But we know from Future State that Teen, Lantern, Teen Lantern's power source isn't the Green Lantern battery. It has its own power source. But it can also charge Green Lantern rings because it charges up Mogo in the Future State Green Lantern. So there's a lot of questions here that I think very interesting. Also, I love the comment when Jon Stewart made the comment with the, with the aggressive Thanagarian, uh, Amira Kalen. She's captain of the United Planets Brigade. She's she kind of looks attractive, and I don't know. When I think of John Stewart, it's hard not to think of the Justice League cartoon where, it, where you know he gets together with Kendra because he likes redheads and he likes Thanagarian. So I always have this thing in my head. Maybe it's just the kid in me, or the you know I'm thinking, oh man, he's gonna end up. 
You know, you know John Stewart is going to end up with the captain of the guard of the United Planets. What the hell, right? So I kind of liked her attitude, and I love when he he said under his breath, uh, "Thanagarian." You know, <laughs> so I I, I kind of like that. I so I thought there was some moments in here that were enjoyable. I uh, I I'm sorry you didn't enjoy it uh, very much, man. I, uh, I yeah, I mean you're right. There are some decent ideas, but you know you hear so many writers talk about the character. I gotta care about the characters. And, and part of, like, if you call this Green Lantern core, I'm automatically more likely to pick up the second issue. And this certainly felt like a Green Lantern core book that was focused on Jon Stewart. My worry is that you're calling it Green Lantern. And in Jeffrey Thorne's mind, if you want to talk about one singular Green Lantern, that's Jon Stewart. And I'm just not interested in reading a, a hero worship book about Jon Stewart with unlikable characters. Jon Stewart himself isn't unlikable by by any means. Um, and it's not Jon Stewart that's tooting his own horn and and saying, I'm the greatest. It's it's, it's the deferential treatment that everybody else is, is talking about him where you feel hit over the head with it. You yourself mentioned it, but Teen Lantern is so unlikable. Uh, the other uh, supporting characters, you know, the the people, uh, the sorcerer from Xerox, the um, the head of the, the United Planets Brigade, like everybody, they all come across as so unlikable. The, the most interesting and likable character in the whole book is the Native American citizen that we don't even get a name for. He's <laughs> he. I want to know more about him more than I want to read yeah. any more about and, Teen Lantern. And, and apparently, you know? apparently anybody, they let anybody read the Book of Oa, apparently. I, yeah. I they must yeah. sell it in the bookstore or something. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I, I just I just worry that, you know, this is going to be this is just a, when you say Green Lantern, you're really talking might as well call this John Stewart, you know, and I don't have an interest in reading a title title that's called John Stewart. Um, if it has so many un unlikable characters, maybe it'll get better. You know, as much as I dislike this, I always say you got to give at least two issues. So um, I'll be back for the second issue. But I'm telling you, if, if it doesn't get better, I'm gonna nope out of this so fast. Uh, yeah, so it just it didn't it didn't work for me at all, unfortunately. So, uh, all right, well let's move on to the last book. Uh, you know, not to beat John Stewart and Green Lantern to death. Uh, so it's Joker, Harley, Criminal Sanity. It's the penultimate issue. It's issue number eight. It's written by Cami Garcia. We have art by Jason Badower and Miko Suyan. Colors are by Annette Kwok. Letters are by Richard Starkings and Comic Crafts, Tyler Smith. Uh, give us your thoughts, Rocky. What did you think of this? I, I, I was actually, I was actually a little bit disappointed with the ending. Uh, although, you know, I, I, I read this, I had to read this twice and it's not because it's dif difficult to read. I was, because when I first read it, I was really disappointed. And then when I read it a second time, I was actually, I thought it was much, I thought it was better. Like, I, I, I really like this Harley. I, I, this is my favorite version of Harley. This is sort of like a real world version of Harley where it's really, this is Harley who takes on the Joker and she does a really good job of it. She catches the Joker at the end. And she, at the end of this issue, what I did really like about it is... I personally got a sense that she was going to kill him. Like she was going to kill him, but you know, leave it to commissioner Gordon to, you know, commissioner Gordon prevents Batman from killing the Joker. And, and, and in this surprise, surprise, commissioner Jordan, uh, Gordon shows up and prevents Harley from, you know, she finally catches him. She finally catches up with him and she's about to put him down and Gordon gets in the middle of it. But in the meantime, you, she's really pieced together. Uh, Cami Garcia has done done such a good job, and the artists Jason Badawar and uh, Miko Suwin Su Su Suyan Suyan Su Thank you, <laughs> colorist Annette Kwok. Fantastic. Uh, I mean, th this is such a gorgeous work. I'm I want to buy this in hardcover form. This is absolutely beautiful, and you you really get a sense every stage of the investigation. Harley was you know you could see she was very intelligent. She. I don't think Harley has ever been displayed as more intelligent in any ser co comic book story than she has in this particular series. They did a, you know, Cami Garcia has done an excellent job there. I, I wish I can understand that this ends with Joker being arrested because she probably 
you know, I, I want to see more stories in this universe. I would love to see a volume two and to see this story continue. I'd be, I can't imagine that they're ever going to explore any kind of love interest in this type of dichotomy between Harley and Joker that exists here. Cause this Joker is really hardcore. This is a Joker that behind the scenes has been honing his psychopathic craft for you know, well, you know, six, seven years through the course of this story. And it's told excellent through various flashbacks and everything else. Garcia's that is really ma masterfully done. You want to talk about, sh you know, showing flashbacks and showing the formative years as the Joker and juxtapose those scenes against, you know, current crime scenes and, and how Harley pieces that all together. And you can, you, you get us, you understand why this Joker is impressed with Harley because she's miles ahead of anyone else in the department or anyone investigating it. And it, it, it really works. And I, I think I was looking for a little bit more, um, a little bit more comeuppance for the Joker. He does get injured. She chases him on a motorcycle. It's very cinematic feel. It, like I said, it, you know, it's, it's there. I guess I wanted a little bit I think this is an underhanded compliment I'm giving uh, Cami Garcia because I I wanted the Joker so badly to get his ass kicked and because he never got his ass kicked enough I'm I'm a little disappointed but that's <laughs> that's to be expected because she is a cop and and the, and so I'm as angry at Commissioner Gordon I think as Harley was at the end cuz she wanted to finish the job and she quit she quit the Gotham PD she goes on her own at the end of this and you got to wonder what lies in store for Harley now, now that she's not with the Gotham City Police Department? She's no longer going to be working for them. Well, what is she going to do then? She, she, does she, is she going to abandon her license to, to be a psychiatrist? Is she going to go into private practice? What does the next volume hold? I got all these questions, and, and I guess in that respect, that's a fairly high compliment to the writing as well. Well, she's going to turn into Harley Quinn. She's going to yeah. put on a well, costume and you take think, matters. But her, who knows? Her right? own yeah. I don't know. I yeah. For me, for me, I was kind of disappointed as well, um, but in, in a different way. Like I, the the first five or six issues, I'd say the first six issues of this series, I thought were were perfect. Um, but the, that being said, this is Harley Quinn, right? So she eventually has to become some version of Harley Quinn. And, you know, to your point, the kind of the story that I wanted to read after getting up to issue six was sort of, hey, uh, here's Harley Quinn. She's a criminal profiler. She is the smartest person in the room. And she catches the Joker and the Joker gets what's coming to him and, and gets the electric chair. And Harley Quinn goes on to catch other, uh, Harley and Quinzel, I should say, goes on to catch other serial killers and psychopaths that's 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 not harley quinn i mean right i mean she's gotta at some point in some way be influenced by the joker whether directly or indirectly to take matters into her own hands to to cross that line and become something inspired by the joker you know whether inspired by chasing and capturing the joker whether inspired to be the joker's girlfriend or, or whatever right so it, it had to not turn out the way that I, I wanted. I, I guess I, I, in a way I wanted the, the happy ending and the good guys to win. And I wanted Harley to be that good guy. Clearly that's not the story that Cammy Garcia is, is telling. So any disappointment I feel it's, it's because of expectations or things that I, I brought to it. Um, oh, so I, I'm not going to blame. Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say one of my expectations, I actually thought Batman was going to show up, but he never did. I, I found it a little bit. I'm sorry. I said, I'm glad he didn't. Yeah, no, no. I, I realize that at the same time, this is Gotham city and there's this big motorcycle chase through Gotham city on motorbikes <laughs> yeah, and true. he's chasing the Joker and Batman's not around. So I did, it did occur to me that, well, where's Batman? Uh, you know, in any event, I, I am curious down the road. I think that uh, I agree with you that, that it's good that Batman takes is on the sidelines here and she's the one that really knows the Joker and for future volumes, I can imagine her. I would like to see Harley take down some of the other Batman rogues galleries. And, and yet her one failure is, is the Joker. You know, I, I'd like to see her take down the, the two, two face and, and Riddler and take out these other, you know, 
psychologically compromised villains. I'd like her to be the, the hero of those stories and not Batman per se. And but yet her one elusive person that she can't catch is the Joker. So I, I can see future volumes not necessarily focusing on the Joker, but building up to it. Uh, but anyways, that's me playing script doctor. But I, I, I don't know. I, this has a lot of potential. Yeah, I don't know that we're going to get more volumes. We'll have to we'll have to to see. And I, and I do agree. I mean, we know at the end of the day, the Joker is going to going to get away. Um, but anyway, going back to what I was saying, I, I don't want to blame Cammy for my disappointment in this issue because every, my disappointment in this issue has everything to do with what really last issue I thought was a step down and this issue as well, um, because I did have those expectations. It was just what I was bringing to it. Uh, but when I look at this on its own um, and what Cammy's trying to do, I, I think she's succeeding very well. Um, but the reason that, that, you know, putting all that aside with, you know, whatever expectations I'm bringing to it and what I was hoping for, which, was, you know, is a much more heroic Harley, which is not who she is. She's a character very much rooted in tragedy. And I think Cammy Garcia explores that very, very well in the, um, the insights and the flashbacks that we get into Harley growing up and her dysfunctional family and the way she was sort of emotionally uh, neglected and, and she didn't receive a lot of affection from her mother and things like that. So you can understand her motivation. You can understand exactly why she makes the choices she makes. And that is the beauty of the story. And it, it is still in that respect, perfect uh, in the way that Cammy has plotted this because at the, I think at the end of the day, when it's all said and done and we finish issue nine, I immediately am going to go back and read the whole thing together in one sitting. And we're going to see that journey that Harley goes on. And we're going to see her make the choices that she's made. And we've already seen her make these choices. Some of the choices she's made in hiding things from the Gotham City Police Department about the Joker coming to her apartment and you know her losing her roommate and things like that. And you can understand why she made the choices that she made. As much as you're sitting there on the sideline reading the story going, no, Harley, don't do not do that. That's the wrong path that you're heading down. And you can't help but feel and empathize with her for the choices she's making because you know they're wrong. And you know that ultimately they're going to lead to bad things. They're going to ultimately lead to more pain for Harley. But you can completely understand why she's making them. The tragedy of the character is something that Cami Garcia has captured maybe better than anybody has ever captured the tragedy of Harley as a character. And that's why I think this is one of the best DC books that's come out in recent years. It's, it's just spectacular. And I think when, like I said, when I sit down and read it all together as one volume, I plan on getting the hardcover too. I want a nice hardcover of this on my shelf um, that people are going to look back on this and go, yeah, you want to read one Harley story. This is it. Yeah. And it's not, you know, not to say Cami Garcia hasn't done other good things. As she's a writer from prose and she's uh, even written some of, uh, I think she wrote the Raven uh, YA novel um, for DC and some other things. And, and clearly a very talented writer, but it's not like a lot of uh, comic book fans know her name. Um, hopefully after this, they, they will, <laughs> because yeah. this is such a, a great uh, quintessential Harley Quinn story. And, and not only uh, that. It's also a good Joker story. She does a, an equally good job developing the the origins of the Joker. Yes, uh, I was going to say is one that. Of the best I've, yeah. I've I've ever read. So I mean, yeah, I was going to I was gonna say that. Yeah, I was going to say that next. I, I we all everybody who listens to uh, my podcast knows how much I dislike the Joker. Um, <laughs> this is the best version of the. This is the best version of the Joker. One that makes sense to me. One that doesn't feel overpowered. Um, and so, yeah, she's done a great job with the Joker as well. He feels realistic. He feels, you know, he's clearly intelligent. He clearly is able to stay one step ahead. He doesn't feel overpowered. He doesn't feel like he's lucking into escaping from the police or, or this or that. So yeah, great job with the, the Joker as well. Um, and the art in the entire series has been spectacular. And I'll talk more about that in, in a second. Um, but I, I do want to talk about one other thing, like putting aside all the work, on character that Cammy's done in this issue. Um, the other part of this issue that left me feeling like it wasn't one of the better um, issues of the series overall, it, there's a couple things. First of all, you got to sort of have a down because the series, the next issue is the final and it's got to finish on an, an upswing, right? So you're going to want an issue that's a little, a little bit in, in terms of, you know, action and story beats on the lower end. So you, 
you can reach that crescendo. You know, everything can't be dialed up to nine the whole time. There's no up and down. Um, there's no playing with our emotions as, as fans. So you've got to have ups and downs in the story. And so you can understand usually a penultimate issue is going to be a little bit more on the downbeat. So you can build up to the, to the climax of the story. Uh, that being said, the, uh, the pacing in this issue wasn't the best. It was maybe the kind of the, where it didn't work as well for me as, as most of, uh, most of the issues. I thought, again, going back to the first six issues, paced and plotted really, really well. This one, it felt a little bit choppy. It felt a little bit rushed at the end. So I don't know, maybe they would have been better suited to go to go 10 issues to give us a little more, um, specifically that motorcycle chase at the end. It just felt very uh, abrupt. Um, and as great as the art is, uh, even the art itself felt a little, a little choppy there um, at the end. So I wish that could have been fleshed out a little more. I would have liked to have seen that motorcycle chase take a little longer and uh, you know, have it go throughout the city and, and get some beautiful city skylines all the time as just as it does in what we get with Harley giving us more of her inner dialogue, you know, as opposed to saying, I'm gaining on him. This ends tonight one way or the other. That's not giving, it's not really giving us that much of what Harley's thinking about. You know, I'd rather would have a little bit more of Harley's insight into what she's thinking while she's trying to chase the Joker down. Give us more of that angst. Um, but you know, there wasn't the real estate and, and it, it does work as it is, but I just felt like that was the weaker part of, of what still is a very good issue. What were you going to say, Rocky? Uh, what, well, just to add that, you know, th this is the, the final issue. So I think it, it, you know, just oh, no, there's one more, there's one more. There, there is still one more. Yeah. It's, it's, there's like it's nine, movie. it's nine issues. It's wow, nine issues. Well, so that's what, I, that's what I'm saying. We're going to get one more issue probably with her becoming the full, you know, the full Harley wow. Quinn. That's, that's awesome. I, I didn't, for some reason, I didn't know that this actually felt like an ending to me. I thought, I thought well, we were just her riding the bike at the end off into the, the into the dark gloomy night. <laughs> yeah. So I, I thought it was nine issues all along and I read this and, and like you said, it did feel very much like an ending. And I went and double checked. I'm like, wait, there is another issue. Right. And now you even have me second guessing myself. I'm going to look it up right now, but I'm well, almost positive you uh, right. that yeah, there is there is another uh, there is another issue. Well, here's here's my compliment to to the issue is that you know Harley's always been Joker's sidekick, and the Joker's obsession has always been with Batman. And it was actually very, I really appreciated the fact that Joker here wasn't so much obsessed, but Joker Joker wasn't obsessed with Batman at all here. He, if anything, if not that he was obsessed with Harley in this series, but he definitely had a fixation on Harley and Harley on him. And I like the fact that Batman was put to the wayside. Batman was just, you know, Batman was not important to that, to this tale at all. And that's why, and this is an open question, especially if there's one issue left is, is there going to be a point where Batman actually becomes important to this particular Joker Harley relationship in this particular continuity in this universe of which this story is being told because i don't need batman to enjoy this these types of stories i don't need batman i gotta have harley taken down in fact i would love a story where harley is the one taken down the rogues gallery in fact we even got teases of that in future state where harley was consulted with the scarecrow and taken out black mask and what have you and having a more adult take on that i think it was would be a hell of an idea and i i, I really like the the you know the more i think about it the fact that I didn't miss Batman. I, I read, I've read, I've read eight issues of Joker and Har mostly Harley, and I don't miss Batman at all. Yeah, every everything I read says one of nine, two of nine, four of nine, but there's no release date for issue nine yet. So, which probably has to do with the art. I mean, the art here, Miko Suyan is not the fastest guy. He's the one that does the uh, the black and white pages and he, i mean both of these artists their their art is absolutely incredible. spectacular incredible line work is is amazing um transitions from panel to panel the detail they put in it's 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 great so um yeah i think it, i think it's really awesome uh and so yeah there's there is supposed to be another issue it just hasn't been solicited yet so we don't have the last date um but the art, yeah, the art, that's part of the reason that I, I picked up the issue in the first place. I'm not a Harley fan. I'm not a Joker fan, but uh, I know Miko Suyan. Uh, he did a ton of work over at Valiant 
Um, and that's how I, I met him. And he's a super great guy and a super talented artist. So uh, that's the whole reason I picked it up. I think I picked it, finally picked up issue four. I'm like, God, I, I hear Miko's killing it on this book. Let me check it out. And I immediately had to go back and buy the first three issues. And yeah, it's, it, it's spectacular. Um, a couple of particular things in this book that I'll call out uh, for artwork on page, I think it's page six, when uh, Jim Gordon goes to Harley's uh, apartment and finds the her kind of diagram there with all the pins and the threads linking things together. The, uh, apart, the apartment manager, I guess, that lets Jim Gordon into the apartment, yep. that's Cami Garcia that he drew. That's what Cami Garcia looks like. Oh, really? So that, yeah, so that's super cool. Um, the other thing that I'll mention that's absolutely amazing in the art is at the end when uh, Harley's there backstage at the concert where Joker uh, kind of gasses a bunch of people and uh, disfigures a bunch of band members or whatnot. That version, that costume and version of Black Canary is amazing. It looks yeah. so, so good. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, like I want, I want that costume and version of of black canary to be in a in a in dc main continuity i mean it's great like the from the canary on the uh on her chest to the the feathers that kind of go around her shoulders back behind her head she has the the fishnets which we've seen uh black canary have a lot of times thigh high boots like yeah really really spectacular and and you can see on that same page right on the next panel because uh, Black Canary kind of takes up the middle of the page and she's breaking uh, panel lines. But on the next panel, the last panel of the page, you can even see that Miko Suyan drew uh, textures into the feathers. Like, yeah. seriously, dude, you're drawing individual lines on the feathers? No wonder it takes so long for these guys to uh, to put out an issue. So uh, it, <laughs> it was on schedule. You know, it was monthly when it first came out, but I imagine as it came on and they got caught up to the issues they had in the can that it it's probably why it's uh, a little late. So I'm all for them taking their time, give, you know, take as much time as you need to give us the final issue. Cause I want them all to, to knock it out of the park and I can't wait to read it all together. So um, yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was great. And for me, this, this was my DC book of the week it, it, and it wasn't really close. I thought that this book st stood uh, head and shoulders above uh, the rest of the stuff that we, uh, that we read this week. So uh, did you have one that uh, you enjoyed more than, than others i actually really enjoyed the ending uh to the the, the swamp thing was my was my favorite the swamp thing number gotcha. two i thought i thought the ideas came together pretty well i thought ram v did an excellent job and that that's that's my book of the week and second would be batman followed by crime syndicate suicide uh crime syndicate joker harley suicide squad and green lantern but honestly i I guess I'm keeping my optimism. I didn't. I didn't dislike any of these books. I was entertained by all of them. I I, I enjoyed reading all of them, e even the Jeffrey Thorne book. Believe it or not, there, uh, Chase. I know it's shocking, but uh, <laughs> I yeah, that really dragged the week down for me. And I, you know, Batman was I thought was mediocre. Uh, Swamp Thing just didn't do it for me. Again, you know, technically a very well done book, but I just it, it's just not engaging to me. Suicide Squad was definitely above average. Um, crime syndicate for me was only average Joker Harley was, you know, far and away the best. Uh, also we have man bat three coming out this week, everybody from DC. I thought that was okay. Um, but again, reading this Harley and then reading Harley and Batman one Oh seven and then reading Harley and man bat. And she literally talks with a different dialect at each one it was just so, uh, strange. It, it's it's the first time that it really was so evident. Uh, but I thought Man Bat Three was okay. Uh, also, uh, I guess it's not called Vertigo anymore, but whatever the used to be Vertigo, the the, the Neil Gaiman verse, whatever you want to call it, uh, the Dreaming Waking Hours number nine is also out this week, which I hear really, really, really good things about. But uh, I just I haven't I fell off all of that Sandman universe stuff a, a long time ago. Um, also, the next to last issue of Far Sector by N.K. Jemison with art by Jamal Campbell comes out this week. And that was a, a series I was really enjoying with Joe Mullen. Um, but I think there were some delays and I fell off of it. I'm still buying them. But I don't think I've read anything past issue like four or five. So I need to get back on that because I definitely want to talk about the last issue when it comes out next month. So, uh, yeah, not not the best week, not not the worst week. Um, 
so yeah i guess we'll i guess we'll have to wait we'll have to wait and see um i'm in i'm definitely in for crime syndicate the next issue i'm in for suicide squad the next issue i'm giving green lantern one more shot and i'm i'm out on uh i'm out on swamp thing and the again the only reason i'm giving green lantern one more shot is because i say you always got to give give two issues so yeah yeah kind of an up and down up and down week for me so uh anyway you got anything uh coming out this week later in the week that you want to plug rocky for uh, uh no, no, listeners I'm gonna... or viewers no, I'm going. I, I've got a number of things, but nothing. I, I I wish I could. I know it's free advertising now if I talk here, but no, I I've got a couple of things that I, I'm I'm still deciding on. But uh, uh, I'll post this, and I got a couple of things that I guess I'll, I'll just have to surprise people. What about yourself? You, you're always uh, yeah, man. You got interviews coming like crazy, don't you? Yeah, I people have been reaching out left and right, or I've been reaching out to people. So uh, porn sock pichochet. Uh, he's coming on, he's got a, a new series coming out from, so if you're not familiar with him, he actually started out as a, an editor at, at DC, uh, for the vertigo line. And he's written some uh, of his own books, the infidel, maybe the one that people most know him for, which was critically acclaimed. Uh, he's a Thai American, um, comic book, uh, writer as well as a television writer. And so he's got a book coming out called the good Asian, which is uh, kind of a pulp noir detective story in that, uh, you know, time where, uh, Asian American uh, racism and the, the uh, I can't remember what it's called. There's like the Chinese American something act where they were limiting the number of uh, immigrants of Asian descent to come into to the United States, obviously very timely, which again, it's so strange how the world works where these creators months and months and months ahead of time come up with these ideas and the books are ready to be released. And then there's some political tie in and people are like, Oh, you're just trying to be political. He's trying to tell a story and it just so happens that we got all these uh this rise in asian american hate going on right now just like we were talking about with the other history of the dc universe last week so he's he's coming on uh, i'm going to interview him soon that episode should be out wednesday uh and then i have an interview with stephanie phillips speaking of harley quinn uh coming up on on friday that'll be released uh probably early next week hopefully rocky will be able to, to join me for that because i know what a fan you are of yeah of first uh, awesome, Sure. Yeah. So, so those are the, yeah, those are the two big interviews that I have coming up this week. And then, you know, Kickstarter spotlight on Wednesday as usual and new comic Wednesday and all, all the regular stuff that you guys are used to. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to those two interviews this week. And um, yeah, I got some other big interview uh, irons in the fire. I don't want to mention any names specifically until they're uh, confirmed, but <laughs> yeah, just be sure you're, uh, you're keeping, you know, you're following us on social media. Rocky's got the links there for you. Uh, it's just at the comic source. Uh, and also, if you're a, a longtime comic source listener, make sure you're going over to YouTube uh, and go to the Comic Boom channel. Give uh, Rocky uh, a like for this video. Make sure you smash that subscribe button. Uh, click that notification bell so you know when he puts out new content. Uh, as you could tell, you know, we just love talking comics and uh, sharing our thoughts on these books with you all. So uh, I know I really appreciate uh, all the support. Uh, I'm sure Rocky does as well. Absolutely. Thanks for coming. So. Out, everybody. Yeah, so thanks for joining us as always, and we will talk to you next time. See you later.